Okay, and part one of our lecture on dislocations was sort of a high-level overview. Now we're going to talk a little bit more uh, specifically about some terminology. So let's begin. Um, so what I'm showing you here is, is sort of a, um, an end-on view of just a, a, a square, a simple cubic lattice um, uh, with, as if you remember from the previous uh, lecture, this upside-down T, that corresponds to the dislocation. And what we're looking at here is called an edge dislocation. I'm not going to hold you responsible for that for this class. But it basically looks like an extra half plane of atoms sticking up in the middle there, okay? So let's give some definitions here. The slip plane is the plane that the dislocation moves on, and it's typically the plane with the highest planar density. Okay, so there's your slip plane for this uh, problem. Okay, the next uh, the next um, uh, quantity that describes a dislocation is 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 the, called the Burgers vector, and and what the Burgers vector is is it's the direction and the magnitude of the slip that uh, is caused by a single dislocation as it moves. So in this case. Uh, it looks like uh, the distance here between just these atoms, because the dislocation is, is slipping the plane, uh, one um, lattice uh, um, um, unit uh, over as it moves. Okay, in general, uh, the Burgers vector is going to be uh, in the direction of uh, the highest linear density. And I think I, I wrote but didn't say that the the slip plane typically is the plane with the highest planar density, okay? And then the final um, characteristic of a dislocation that we would use to describe it is the unit tangent, uh, unit vector that's tangent to the dislocation line at any point. And in this case, uh, this is called the sense vector. We define it as C. So the sense vector here would be straight out of the screen. So that's what I'm drawing here, right? The dislocation runs uh, in and out of the screen. So the sense vector, which is tangent, just runs in and out, okay? Um, the relationship between the Burgers vector and the sense vector define what's called the dislocation character. Uh, that character is typically defined as either edge, screw, or mixed. Okay, uh, I'm not going to uh, delve too much into those definitions uh, because I think that uh, we're trying to, to move a little more rapidly to uh, some more uh, kind of engineering applications. I think you'll get a little bit more of that in, in a subsequent class. Okay, so that's, that's all the, that you really need to know about dislocation terminology for this class. Okay. How do we quantify dislocations? So what I showed you there was one dislocation, but obviously, uh, if you remember the videos I showed you, there's uh, th there's quite a significant number of dislocations in any given material. We we uh, report what are, what's called dislocation density, which is just simply the uh, dislocation line length, the total line length of dislocations per unit volume. So it's typically going to be in units of one over. Uh, a centimeter squared or a one over meter squared. Okay, let me give you a uh, just a sort of a uh, reference number for that. So in heavily deformed copper, the dislocation density is typically 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared. In annealed copper, uh, it's typically about 10 to the seventh uh, per centimeter squared. That doesn't mean a lot to you, I understand. So l let me try to phrase it in a different way. How long are the dislocation lines in, let's say, the following? How about one cubic centimeter of heavily deformed copper? So, you know, something that's about yay big. How, how long are those dislocation lines uh, in that, that, that one cubic centimeter if we were to take out all the dislocation lines and stretch them out? Okay. Well, uh, maybe you'd be surprised to find that it would actually wrap around the earth at the equator 25 times. Okay. So, uh, that hopefully you're starting to get a, a flavor of the challenge of trying to simulate this directly uh, if you wanted to even model one cubic centimeter of material. Okay, uh, what that also means is that if we want to work hard in the material, so we want to take annealed copper and make it heavily deformed by, you know, beating it with a hammer or rolling it or something, uh, then by work hardening it, work hardening it, what we're really doing is we're adding 625,000 miles of dislocation line to it. I don't think you probably ever thought of it in those terms before, but but that's what we're doing. Okay, how about in a cubic meter of heavily deformed copper? So with one centimeter, one cubic centimeter, uh, the length scale that's relevant is sort of 
the circumference of the earth, okay? If we're gonna go to a cubic meter of heavily deformed copper, uh, we need to talk about the solar system. So with in one cubic meter of heavily deformed copper, we could go to Pluto and back 65 times. Um, how about we go a little further just for fun? What about if we had 3.4 meters, uh, that, that, that's the side length um, cubed of heavily deformed copper? Well, there'd be enough line length there to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. So uh, now, now the uh, the relevant length scale is light years. Um, so d just to put that in perspective, when we simulate dislocations, and, and if we're not simulating atoms, we're just simulating the lines themselves, usually we're discretizing those maybe on the order of something like 10 nanometers would be like a typical discretization length. So you figure we have to discretize these things at a length scale of uh, uh, 10 nanometers, but in, in this amount of material, there's actually, uh, uh, there's actually a line length measured in light years. So that, that starts to become, uh, you can see a, a significant challenge to, to directly modeling the deformation of metals. Okay. So that's, that's uh, all I want to say about dislocation density. Um, I'm going to now start running through some of the characteristics that I talked about uh, previous, previously um, with respect to dislocation. So the first one is the, the stress field. So dislocations have an associated stress field, which is typically very complex uh, and difficult to compute exactly. Um, it can be done, but it's beyond the scope of this course. So if we just take a really simple model, then you can imagine that if I have this extra half plane of atoms here, uh, that this part in the upper region is in compression because of that, and this part down here is, is in tension, right? So we're not going to go that, that route, but what I do want you to remember is that the general form for a dislocation stress field is uh, proportional to mu times B over R. So mu is the, um, uh, the shear modulus of the material, B is the Burgers vector magnitude, and R is the distance from the dislocation, right? So uh, if, if we were actually at the dislocation core, the stress is infinite. We have to do something else once we get to that point. But uh, in general, the far field values of dislocation stress are mu B over R. Uh, just by way of uh, keeping you informed, I'll show you uh, uh, this, this picture here where I'm looking at this actual dislocation. Um, and I'm looking at the sigma 1, 1, the sigma 2, 2, the sigma 3, 3, and the sigma 1, 2 stress. It turns out in this case, um, the other, the other sigma 1, 3, and 2, 3 stresses are zero. Um, so this just gives you a flavor for how complex the, uh, the stress field is. Um, but, but for this class, like I say, you just need to know this uh, mu B over R is the, the stress field. Okay. So the other critical a characteristic that we talked about in the previous lecture was that dislocations move, right? You saw that in a variety of uh, videos. So we know that dislocations glide or move, but we typically use the word glide, uh, in response to an applied shear. Okay, so uh, here's a, a picture of that, right? So here's our dislocation. There's our little upside down T, and we're applying a shear stress this direction on the top and this direction on the bottom. And as that dislocation moves, it's going to shift the top relative to the bottom by uh, one Burgers vector. This is an example of a screw dislocation, same load. The difference is that now uh, the screw dislocation, the Burgers vector is along this direction still, but it's moving this way, creates the same thing, but uh, just two different dislocation characters working. Okay. So what's the, the relevant feature is actually the shear stress on uh, the slip plane. And, and this is actually called the resolved shear stress. Okay. Something to also note, and I think I mentioned this in the previous lecture as well, is that because dislocations only glide under an, an applied shear load, they can't glide under a hydrostatic stress state. Okay, What happens when they move? Well, when dislocations move, they cause lattice slip, as you see in this picture, which leads to plastic strain. That's what plastic strain is. And we can write the the plastic strain rate equation, so epsilon sub p for plastic strain, and the dot tells you it's a rate, is going to be proportional to the dislocation density times the magnitude of the Burgers vector times the velocity of all the dislocations. So if I want to make a material stronger, which means that I want to have less plastic strain, right, uh, from a given uh, point, uh, starting point, what do I need to do? Well, I need to, I need to stop dislocations from moving. So 
that's really the focus of this class for when we talk about how we can, at least for the case of metals, how can we make metals stronger? We figure out ways to stop dislocations from moving. So how do we do that? Well, dislocations uh, interact. So we're going to talk now about the interactions that they have. Uh, they can interact with a variety of things. Uh, the first is they can interact with each other. They can annihilate, they can form junctions, uh, they can block each other. So something like, I'm just, this is from my own uh, uh, PhD work. Uh, you can just see two dislocations coming together. They're going to join on this line of intersection and, and they may or may not form a junction. They may block each other or something like that. Okay. So they interact. So what could we do to, uh, to, to strengthen a material with this mechanism? Well, we could add a lot more dislocations. So they interact a lot more often, right? If we do that, then, then the material becomes a stronger. That's what gives us actually strain hardening typically where, you know, you initially yield and then the material gets stronger and stronger until it finally fails. Okay. The next, uh, uh, type of interaction is that, that, uh, dislocations can interact with point defects via their stress fields. So it's a little challenging to think about, but let's just for, for the sake of example, think of a, an interstitial, right? If you were an interstitial and you were located in this material, where would you want to be? Well, if you know that uh, there's already a half plane of atoms smashed up in here, so you probably aren't going to be in there. You're, and this plane here, it wants to stretch out. So you probably want to actually wedge yourself right there, right? Well, that's great. So you do that, that now uh, is a lower energy state than elsewhere where you could be. The problem, the thing now is that the dislocation uh, doesn't really want to move from there because it's a lower stress state. So these point defects have the effect of, of uh, sort of pinning the dislocations where they're at and, and acting as a blocker, okay? The next uh, type of interaction is with what's called second phase particles. We haven't talked about that yet, but kind of think of if we were to just add... Um, glass beads, for example, uh, that's, a, that's a bad example, but, but let's suppose some small, um, uh, some small uh, inclusions into a, into a pure metal. And so that's what you're looking at here. These, oops, uh, uh, these black, um, uh, circles are are the second phase particles and you can see that they this look at the dislocation can't move through those in the same way that it moves through the lattice and so they effectively block it okay and then the final um, type of interaction we want to talk with talk about is with planar defects most frequently grain boundaries we'll talk a little bit about twin boundaries as well and so in that case the dislocations come to a grain boundary in this case and they are blocked right sometimes they can they can they can be retransmitted or something we're not going to go into that. We're just going to say that dislocations typically get blocked at grain boundaries. So those are the ways that we can increase the strength. And I know it sounds a little bit maybe um, abstract and theoretical, but this is precisely what we're going to be trying to do with, let's take steel, for example, to make it stronger. We're going to do things that, that, um, that make each of these blocking mechanisms uh, uh, more viable uh, to make the material stronger. Now I will say, and I'm going to, I'm going to repeat this throughout the course multiple times. There's typically going to be a trade-off. We can make something stronger uh, by, let's say, blocking dislocations. But what do you know about dislocations now? Hopefully, you know that dislocations also carry plastic strain. They give us ductility, right? So if we can we want to increase the strength by blocking dislocations, we necessarily reduce the ductility. So there's frequently a trade-off between strength and ductility. So something that's very soft and, and has a lot of, uh, you know, elongation to failure, something like that, probably not going to be very strong. On the other hand, something that's super strong, probably not going to be very ductile because uh, uh, the dislocations are not able to move uh, to accommodate the, the, um, the load. So kind of the, the, the top, the best materials out there are going to be the sweet spot uh, where we can get quite a bit of strength and not reduce the ductility too much. Okay, so we're going to talk about those things as class goes on.